I want to play a bit of a, a, a get to know you game with you guys. Um, so, for example, when I was getting to know Casey, actually before I got to know Casey, I knew who she was. And the first time that I met her, I knew that there was this, this amazing woman that was just full of brilliance and, and wonder. And she just had like, I mean, she was incredible. I, I could tell from the first time that I met her that she was just this amazing person. But I also didn't want anything to do with her. I wanted nothing to do with her because she was complicated and she had a bit of a, a story with her and she had, was doing all this mission stuff. And I mean, it was, it was something I didn't want anything to do with her. But as I got to know her more and as I got to know her better, I started to learn and realize that actually there's more about Casey that I like and I was having fun with her. I would, we would meet because she wasn't filling out spreadsheets right and we would sit down at a table and have coffee and I'd be like, Casey, if we're giving you guys food for your ministry, you've got to fill out this, you've got to do this, this, and this. And, and Casey was very bubbly. I mean, she's very smart, but she was like, okay, okay, you know, whatever. But I started to notice as I got to know her more, I got to like her more. I got to, I, I, I got to, it's, I, I've got to a place where I was actually like, I actually kind of want to spend time with this lady, with this girl. You know, it, as I got to know Casey, I enjoyed her more. So the getting to know Casey process was kind of fun. But that's not the way for all of us. So I want to call the guys out right now. The, the, the guys, when we play the get to know you game, I had two encounters this weekend where I went and picked Leafa up at friends' houses. And you go and all the guys, you know, there's maybe a lit fire or something and, and, and the guys assume a position. So you kind of stand with your feet out like this and you put one hand in the pocket and, and if, it's a good, if it's a good day, you've got maybe a beer or something here, and this is your, like, hey, how you doing? I'm talking to you, but I don't, but I don't want to be here with you. You know, Alan's not that way. Alan's free. He'll just, he'll just talk to you and make you feel comfortable and at home. But I know I've been in a lot of circles where I've sat with, with, with guys around a bri or, or, or hanging out, and it's like, it's, it's hard. It's like pulling teeth, the, the, the get to know you process. So you talk about the weather, you talk about, I mean, please, Lord, let there be a rugby game. Please let there be a bribe. Please let it be raining or something, just something that you, can, that you can talk about so that you can kind of break the ice and get to know each other. But most guys don't actually want to get to know each other, but you're stuck. You're stuck in the room together in the environment, and so you've got to just like muscle through this awkward thing. So I don't know if you guys have been there or if you've dealt with that, but I know that, that I have, and, and it's painful. It's really, really hard. You know, one of the things also when it comes to getting to know people or getting to know yourself or people getting to know you is, is as, so what would happen if you showed up at someone's house for like a bri or something and you're standing around a circle and you realize that the people that were there had an opinion of you before they even got to know you. You know, what, what if people had this opinion that like, oh, I, that, that guy is not good, that guy's not this, or man, that guy's a, you know, whatever. That guy drives a 1998 Feroza. We need to, he's, you know, that's weird. We need to, we need to keep him out of the, you know, you know, so. It's, 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 you know, you, you wouldn't feel good about that. You'd be like, well, wait a minute, you don't know me. That's not fair for you to form an opinion about me before you know me. And, and we do that so often where we go to people or when we meet people, we may already have like a preconceived idea or an opinion about who they are or about something about them. And, and that's easy to do when you're having the opinion, but we're, when you're on the other end of that, when you're receiving that opinion, it's like, it's not fair. It's like, wait a minute, you don't know me. That's not fair. It, it's like it makes me think back to if I had told Casey everything that I thought about her before I got to know her, she would have been like, wait a minute, that's not right. That's not okay. You know, but as I got to know her, my opinion of her was sort of corrected. And this is something that we do with Jesus and that so many people do with Jesus so often is I love hearing people talk about how Jesus is not, a, is not a good father or not a good God. Or they say, how can you worship Jesus or how can you be a Christian? Or the Jesus that I know condemns me or I have to do this or do that. Or, or why, why does Jesus let bad things happen to good people? There's all these questions. And we form these opinions about Jesus. And we think that we know Jesus, but actually it's the same thing. It's not fair because we're forming an opinion about somebody that we don't actually know. 
So if you struggle with Christianity or you struggle with Jesus or if you're not even a Christian out there and you just accidentally tuned in here or somebody got you to tune into this sermon, if you're not a Christian, that's okay. But whatever you think about Jesus, I'd like to maybe challenge that a little bit and say, do you know him? Now, if you get to know someone and you still don't like them, then you're, that's great. You can have that opinion. You can have that, you can have that feeling. But I want you to get to know him. I want you to, to get to know Jesus before you form that opinion. And so that's what we're going to do today. We're going to get to know Jesus a little bit. We're going to get to know him through, through a, a, a story. We're going to get to know Jesus through this, this really magnificent story about... Um, see, Jesus was a heavenly... Fa- Je- Jesus' whole purpose for us here on earth. If, if you take everything that we learned about Jesus and you throw it away. If you just get rid of everything that you know about Jesus and you dump it and then you just look in the gospels, you just look at the gospel message, then what you'll find in the gospels is that Jesus is actually just all about relationships. So Jesus was a relational God. So everything that we think we know about Jesus, let's dump it. Let's look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and we can see that Jesus was highly, highly relational. And in fact, everything that Jesus taught and everything that he did for us, he did from kind of a father's heart. And if we look at his stories, if we look at the things that he did, he he, he breaks down into these three categories more often than not. Father and child, vine and branch, shepherd and sheep. So Jesus would say, I'm I'm the father and you are the child. He He would call us his sons. You know, the vine and the branch, Jesus would say that the vine feeds the branch. It brings life to it. And the shepherd and sheep semi-insult him because sheep are the dumbest animals out there. And so Jesus is like, hey, I'm the shepherd. I'm the good shepherd. And you guys are the sheep. And it's like, well, we are actually pretty dumb, you know, as a people group and as humanity. But the point here that I want you to, to start to realize is what Jesus was actually about. And in order for you to learn what Jesus is about, I need you to first dump everything that you think you know and just get rid of it so that we can focus on the things that Jesus is actually about. And we're going to do that today by looking at a story in Matthew. Now, this is a story that we all know or that many of us know. This is a kind of a famous story. But what we're going to see when we look at this story, we're going to see some of Jesus' character come out. And so we're gonna, we're, I'm going to tell this to you like a story. We're going to talk about it like a story, which I, I love these kinds of messages because we're going to, we get to see kind of this, I want to bring the gospel and the, the Bible alive to you. And if you've never read the Bible or you're not interested in it, then just treat this like a story. Follow along. You don't even have to believe it, but just hear it and receive it. So our story picks up here in Matthew 9, 9, and it says this, As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew. So Jesus has just come into a town. He's come into a port city, and he sees this guy named Matthew who's sitting sitting there. So Jesus saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. So here's what we can already pick up about Jesus immediately. And I know this, and you don't know this, but I've done research on it, so I'll tell you about it. I'll give you a little context to this. See, Matthew was a tax collector. Now, what that meant as a tax collector is that Matthew was the lowest of the low. Tax collectors were viewed as just almost like, like, like the, they were hated. So the way that the tax collector system worked is Rome was over the, Rome was in charge. So Rome as the empire was over everything. And Rome pulled taxes from all the people, from Judea, from Jerusalem, from all the different cities and all the different villages. Rome pulled taxes. And what, what the Romans would do is they would let people bid on who was going to get the ability to tax like a city or a town or a village. And so people would bid on it. And then whoever won the bid for the ability to collect taxes... That person would then go into that city, that town, or that village, and that person would then say, hey, who locally can I actually pull in and hire to collect taxes? And so they were hiring local Jews or local people that had been, you know, thrown out of the church, or, or there, there really wasn't a church. There was just the Jewish religion. And so Matthew would have been a Jew who would have been hired by a Roman to collect taxes, 
Now, they could collect as much as they want. I mean, we, we have, what, a 14, 15% VAT tax. They probably, you know, had a, a, an 80% tax. But they would just tax everything, tax roadways, tax crossways, tax food, tax this, tax that. And Rome would say, well, we get what's ours, but anything else that you get, you can keep. And so this was incredibly lucrative. This was, I mean, this was great. We think corruption is going on now. I mean, it started, you know, from at the beginning of humanity here. And so the way that Matthew was viewed is Matthew is viewed in such a low light. So Jesus walks up to someone and says, follow me. But he says it to the person that is at the bottom of the cultural totem pole. I mean, he's at the absolute bottom. And so that tells me immediately that, hey, Jesus' call is for everyone. Jesus doesn't filter his call. Now again, we're, we're getting to know Jesus. So as we get to know Jesus based on who he's called, Jesus has already kind of broken so many mindsets in that day. I mean, the Jewish leaders and the other rabbis, they would have never even associated themselves with a tax collector. And Jesus goes in, the first thing he does is he breaks all of those mindsets and he calls a tax collector to come and follow him. And so what does Matthew do? Matthew got up and followed him. I could just see minds just, minds just blowing. The Pharisees' minds just, blowing. Because see, at the time, Jesus had not picked his 12. Jesus just had followers. He didn't have his 12 disciples. There was, there was a group of people that followed Jesus, and some of them were Pharisees, and they followed Jesus around, and their whole purpose was to take notes and see what Jesus did right and what Jesus did wrong, and try and find a way to convict him for being, uh, for, for, to, to be able to put him to death. And so they're like, okay, Jesus comes up. Jesus is asking people to follow him. Okay, that's a note. Okay, Jesus is talking to a tax collector. That's a bad thing. Okay, Jesus is actually called a, wait, what? Jesus is called a tax collector to come and follow him? That's insane. And see, at the time, Jesus was viewed as a rabbi. Now, a rabbi would have been someone that would have called disciples into fellowship with them. But you would only have called the, the smartest and the brightest Jews into a fellowship with you as a rabbi. Because you, you would be teaching, you'd be passing your legacy down to them. That's the way the Pharisees and their system worked out. But that's also why Jesus went out and he called people like fishermen and tax collectors because these were Jews that were not chosen. And so therefore they were doing other things to make money. And Jesus goes out and he calls those to him. Which I think is amazing. Again, look at his heart. Jesus is like, hey, I'll pick all these people that everyone else has looked over. So if you've been looked over, Jesus may be perfect for you. And so let's, let's read on here. So Jesus gets up, Matthew gets up. And not only does Matthew get up and follow him, in, in verse 10 we see that while Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, so Jesus makes it super easy for Matthew. Matthew, I want you to follow me. And this call to follow was a formal follow. It wasn't like, hey, follow me over here for a minute. It was like, Matthew, be a part of my fellowship. Follow me. And then, Matthew, I'm going to make it so easy. I want you to cook me dinner. I'm coming to your house. Now, I love that. I love cooking dinner. Or we, Casey and I love hosting people. But also, we love it just when people cook for us. It's amazing. Somebody, we've got some friends that brought us dinner this week. Chili con carne. I think they're right, right over here. It was amazing. And so Jesus says, Matthew, I'm coming to your house for dinner. So while Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. Many of them. So it's not just Jesus and, and Matthew, it's, it's Jesus and Matthew and all of Matthew's cronies and all of Matthew's friends. Now what's interesting about this is there's a difference between tax collector and sinner. Because sinners were really low, sinners were viewed as unclean and unfit for Jewish culture, but so were tax collectors. It's like they weren't the same person, they were viewed as, as different people, but both equally as disqualified as the other. 
And the problem that you have here is you have this whole group of people that are pushed outside of the culture, that are seen as unclean, seen as unfit, and then here you have Jesus having dinner with them, and many of them are there, and they ate with him and his disciples. So again, we're about to see in the next verse another just poof, mind-blowing situation to the Pharisees. So put yourself in the shoe of a Pharisee. You've studied the Old Testament. You know it by heart. Your whole job is to be completely clean and completely perfect. Here comes this rabbi that says he's the son of God. And what does he do? He goes and he gets the most unclean, most unperfect people. And he brings them in. He has dinner. Actually, he goes to their house and has dinner with them. Just mind-blowing. Now, verse 11, the next verse tells us how the rest of the story is going. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked the disciples, so pause right here. Guess who wasn't invited? It was the Pharisees. So Matthew's like, cool, Jesus, I'll bring you in to dinner. And so Jesus goes and he has dinner with these people. But when the Pharisees saw, that means the Pharisees are outside the house. So why would they still follow Jesus? Well, because they're, they're critical. They're trying to be critical of Jesus. So not only does Jesus have disciple followers, but Jesus also has this group of Pharisees that are following him around, trying to tell him everything that he's doing wrong, or keeping track of everything that he's doing wrong. And so the Pharisees are outside and they're like, you know, I would assume maybe the disciples are coming in and out, going to the bathroom or, or something like that. But as they walk out, the Pharisees ask, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? So again, the, they just can't understand it. They're like, Jesus, you say you're a rabbi like us, but look at what you're doing. I don't understand it. I don't understand you, Jesus, is what they're saying. I don't understand your character, who you are, how you are. And so Jesus hears this. He hears what the Pharisees say. And in this verse 12, he says, On hearing this, Jesus said, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. So the Pharisees thought that they were healthy and that the tax collectors and sinners were the sick. And so Jesus is actually speaking in their terms. He's like, okay, Pharisees, I'm going to speak in your terms. I'm not here for you. I'm not here for the healthy. I'm here for for the sick. I like to think at that point, Matthew probably bumps Jesus. He's like, hey, what are you talking about? Are we the sick? Jesus is like, yes, you guys are all the sick. I'm here for you guys. So I don't know if that would be personally offensive or not. But Jesus makes the point to the Pharisees, I'm not here for you. I'm not here for what you think that I'm here for. I'm not here to just be righteous like you think. I'm here for for the sick. And he goes on to explain it because he knows that they're dense. He knows that they've not gotten it. He knows that they've not understood what he's trying to say. So in verse 13, he says, but go and learn what this means. So now what Jesus is about to do is very clever. He actually quotes Hosea. So he quotes a verse from Hosea, which he knows that the Pharisees are going to know this verse. He knows it. And so he says, hey, but go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. So remember, mercy is something that you give to someone that doesn't deserve it. So the Jewish culture and the Pharisees' culture was all about sacrifice. You sacrifice, you sacrifice. That's how you're clean. You sacrifice so you can become clean. Whereas Jesus says, how about we give a bunch of mercy? How about we give people a bunch of stuff they don't actually deserve? And again, this is like, I can't explain to you how radically different of a mindset this was than what they carried around and what they thought about. And so he goes on to say, for I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. Now this come to call part, I've not come to call the righteous, but instead the sinners. Now, this is a message. I want to pause and speak to the church here. I want to speak to, to who we are as South Point, who, who we are as capital C. You know, Christians, we like to have this saying where, where there's little C, which is like South Point Church, and then capital C is the bigger church. You know, the church is a fellowship, is a congregation around the world. You know, capital C, little C. And I want to speak to who we are, because I can't, right now, I can't speak to the whole world, but I can speak to us, and I can speak to you in this room. If you're, if you're a part of this church, now, if you're not a Christian, or you're not a part of this church, or you're just visiting, then you can just sit back and chill right now. You can just relax. You can take it easy, and you can listen to me just get on to the church and give them a scolding. 
But what I want, what I want this church to know, what I want this church to get is that, is that we can't become a church. We cannot become a church that's okay with believing the right things and doing the right things and then leaving it at that. We can't become a church who is content to believe the right things and behave the right ways and then let it stop there. We just can't be that. We, we, we can't be okay with, with, what, with us being fine in here, but then what's out there is not okay. We can't be okay with us accepting each other in here, but then not accepting what's out there. We can't be okay with loving the people that walk through our doors on Sundays and saying hello to somebody at, at a coffee counter or at a greeting station or in the hallway, but then when we go out there, we're different. We're not the church. The church that is content to just believe right and behave right is the church that becomes the Pharisees outside of Matthew's house. I can't pastor a church that's content with just believing right and behaving right. I, I have got, I want us, and I believe that we are, and I know that we do it, but I want us always to remember as a church that I don't want to be outside Matthew's house with the Pharisees. I want to be inside Matthew's house with Jesus. I want to be inside that house experiencing the love and the mercy and the grace that Jesus is modeling to these people that otherwise would have never been witnessed to or loved on or received any of that. That's the church that I see. That's the church that I want to build, but that's what I want to build in us. That's what I want us to have because everyone in the world needs a little bit more of that. Everyone could use a little more Jesus. Everyone could use a little more love. So the Pharisees' message was this. The Pharisees' message was change and you can join us. That's why the tax collectors and that's why sinners, they were separated. And it was, you've got to change in order to join us. You change, you join us. Now Jesus had a different message. Jesus' message was join me and you will change. See, Jesus knew something. He knew something that we, that, that we don't know and that they didn't know. Jesus knew, because he was Jesus, he knew the power of acceptance and love. And so Jesus knew that, hey, if you just join me, I, I don't care if what you are, what you aren't, what you do, what you don't do, your hangups, your addictions, your guilt, all that stuff, I don't care. Just join me, because if you join me, I'll change you. And that, that was such a different message than what the Pharisees were teaching. And so from this story, I've got four things about you and Jesus. Four, 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 four things about you and Jesus. Now these four things about you and Jesus, I, this is God's, I want you, again, I so deeply desire that you get to know Jesus. None of the Bible matters if you don't know Jesus, if you don't get, take, take a chance and get to know him and get to know who he is. Otherwise, it's just a collection of your own opinions and thoughts, or it's just you trying to interpret what you think that the Bible means or what it says or what it tells you to do, or, or Jesus says, I need to read my Bible every day. Jesus says, I need to pray and repent. Jesus says, I need to do this. I need to do this. Jesus says, I need to quit all these habits and I need to, I need to stop doing these things. But you know what? Actually, all Jesus says is, come follow me. Just like you are. Just, just like you are. Come follow me. And so the first thing that I want you to know about Jesus is this. Being a sinner does not disqualify you. It's a prerequisite. So being a sinner doesn't disqualify you. It's a prerequisite. Now this is important because we're all sinners. All of us. So if you look around or you think in your mind like everyone's like, man, there's, there's always that one person that you think is really good. For me, it's, it's my wife. I'll use her again. I'm always like, man, I know what I think. I know what I think when I'm in traffic. I know what I think when people do dumb stuff or I hear stories. I'm like, you know, I have these thoughts. And then I think, well, but Casey, she probably has pure thoughts or better thoughts. Or, or to me, it's like, I, I know my wife is the good person that I aspire to be. But she's a sinner as well. You know, we, we're, we're all, we've all failed. You do one sin, you failed. You do one sin, you're a sinner. It doesn't matter. Across the board, it doesn't matter. It is a prerequisite to be a sinner to come and get to know Jesus. 
if you were not a sinner, then that's kind of like you're God. And we know that you're not a God. So we all fit this prerequisite. So that means everyone that hears this at any point in time fits this. We're all this. So you can be a sinner to get to know Jesus. Now the next thing is, is this here. Being an unbeliever doesn't disqualify you. Now this is going to be a little controversial to some of you, but guess what? None of Jesus' earliest followers actually believed. Jesus was a rabbi. He wasn't a messiah to them. Two years into Jesus' ministry, he's still telling the disciples, oh, you of little faith, oh, you of unbelief. He's saying, guys, believe in me. Why don't you believe in me? If you believed, you could do this, you could do this, you could do this. He's constantly teaching his disciples that, hey, you have a belief problem. You don't believe in me. In fact, it was two years into Jesus' ministry when Peter finally says, hey, you're the son of God. You're the son of the Messiah. And then guess what happens? When Jesus dies and he gets put on the cross and he gives his life and he dies, Jesus no longer is the Messiah to these guys. Jesus is a dead rabbi. They still don't believe. Isn't that crazy to think that, that Jesus' earliest followers didn't even believe? In fact, it was only after his resurrection that many of them actually came and said, you know what, we believe in you as, as our resurrected heavenly father. We believe in you as the son of God. But up until that point, many of them struggled with belief. Many of them struggled with believing. In, in fact, doubting Thomas. We all know that Thomas was so unbelieving that he was given the nickname Doubting Thomas. I mean, Jesus has, has resurrected from the grave. He appears to the disciples multiple times, and they're still having a hard time believing. So here we have, I want you to know that the, the loving Jesus that I'm in love with, that's Lord of my life, that I know and that I know knows me has now told me that I can be a sinner and I don't even have to believe in him to follow him. Now the third thing that we learn about Jesus is this, the invitation to follow is purely an invitation to relationship. Jesus wants relationship. That's why he tells Matthew, come follow me. And then he goes and he has dinner with Matthew and all of his friends because it's all about relationship. So it wasn't Matthew, come follow me, but on the way, stop doing this and this and, and repent of this and that. And by the way, you can't do these things. No, Jesus was like, hey, come follow me and then let's have dinner together. Have you ever felt, have you ever been somewhere where you've been around somebody who's so comfortable with who they are that you're comfortable being who you are around them? I mean, you just walk into a room and those people, one of those, those kind of people are there and you're just like, oh man, this person is so comfortable in who they are. Like, I feel comfortable in being who I am. The room just feels easier. You know, contrasting that, have you ever been walked into a room where someone was like uncomfortable? You know, uncomfortable with who they are. If you're married, you know the answer to this question is yes. Because you walk in on your spouse and before they say anything, you just know like, oof, something's off today. You then you just turn around and find something else to do. But Jesus was so comfortable in who he was that it made it easy for people to be comfortable in who they were. You can be comfortable as a sinner and as an unbeliever because all Jesus wants from you first is relationship. Now this second part here, God's kindness leads to repentance. Paul would later on write that. The heart of Jesus is to love. The heart of Jesus is not to condemn. Jesus' heart is to love on us, not condemn us. It's Jesus' kindness that brings us to him. It's his kindness it's his gentleness that brings us to relationship with him why would Jesus invite us into a relationship and then just slap us down or be mean to us that's not who he is that's not the heart of the father and remember as as we get to know Jesus we get to know God because Jesus wanted us to know God and so he modeled God for us and so Jesus is saying hey it's my I'll be kind to you I'm going to love you. 
Instead of having, instead of, for, for those of us that are Christians that believe in having a quiet time or believe in reading our Bible or having a, a daily devotional or a prayer time, what would your devotional be like in the morning or your prayer time in the morning if instead of getting up or instead of sitting down to do that, instead of thinking like, man, I just, I got to read my Bible. I got to do it because that's what I'm supposed to do as a Christian. I know I need to spend time with God. I know everyone has taught me I need to do that. I know I need to bring my sin to Him and ask for forgiveness you know but what would happen if instead of thinking that way instead you just thought like man God is so kind to me he's so good to me he loves me so much I'm just gonna go sit in the love of my heavenly father I'm just I'm just gonna sit there and let him love me just as I am See, Jesus' love is so important to us and his kindness is so good for us that it just, it draws us to repentance. It draws us to him. And repentance, all repentance is, is it's you aligning yourself with God. You aligning yourself with Jesus because you're letting go of, you're saying, okay, I repent. I just want to get rid of all this other cruft and stuff that's in me. And Jesus, you're so kind and you're so good. I want to let you just fill that up. Now, the, the last thing here, the fourth thing, is that following Jesus, so like Matthew, getting up and following Jesus, forces me to focus on where I am instead of where you are not. So the Pharisees are a great example of this. What were the Pharisees focused on? They were focused on where the tax collectors and the sinners were not. Hey, those are not good people. Those are not clean people. Those are not Jewish people. Those are not, are not, are not. Whereas Jesus is saying, hey, I've called you to follow. Come and follow me. Come and follow me. Come and follow me. And Matthew is saying, you know, cool. I get to focus on just following Jesus because he's kind, because I can be a sinner, because I don't have to believe in him, because his love is for me and his kindness is for me. And now I, I get to just focus on coming to Jesus and I'm not gonna worry about who, who isn't coming or who's not coming or where someone is or where they're not. See, th this, is, this to me is a powerful statement for how I pastor people. This is how I try and pastor the church. People come to me and they, they want, it's like they feel like they have to have to pay penance for their sin or they have to admit that they've done something wrong. And I'm like, okay, that's great. We can, we can walk you through repentance to God. But as far as me, I'm not really concerned with where you're not. I'm just more concerned with you knowing that God loves you in such a kind way that you can just come to him. This is what I want everyone to get is the freedom and the love for them to come to Jesus. So I want you to know, and this is so important, is that nothing disqualifies you from a relationship with Jesus. Absolutely nothing disqualifies you from God and from the invitation to follow. Nothing. There's nothing that you can do. There's no person on earth that disqualifies you from God's grace. When people ask me, where does the church stand on all these different social issues? Where does the church stand on gender issues? Where does the church stand on sexual issues or family issues or all of these things? Yes, there's things in the Bible that we believe in that, that we agree in and that we stand on. And those are the foundation of what we are. But you know what? Nobody out there is disqualified from the invitation to come to God. Period. There's not a single person born on this planet, past, present, or future, that are disqualified from this. Because if you're disqualified from an invitation to God, then that means you're telling me that your sin is outside of the grace of Jesus. But Jesus, is, Jesus covered all sin. Jesus' grace encompasses all of our sin and all of us. So nothing disqualifies you from that invitation. And so before I ask you this last question, I'll just ask the band to come up. And they're, they're going to come out and get set up and play one more worship song. And, and while they do that, I just want to ask you guys this. And or I want you to ask yourself this. Am I enough? Am I enough to follow Jesus? I, I really don't know where you sit with your relationship with Jesus or how you feel about Jesus or who you think Jesus is or who you think Jesus thinks that you are. I don't know. I'm not in your house. I don't know. 
I don't know where you are with all of that. But what I do know is that I want you to ask the question of, am I enough to follow Jesus? Am am I enough? And the answer to that is yes. Because you don't have to be, you don't have to be, or you can be a sinner. You can can be an unbeliever because you serve an incredibly, incredibly kind God. Ben, you guys can come on out. So wherever you sit, wherever you are, wherever you are in your relationship with Jesus, whatever you think you know about Jesus or you don't know about Jesus, I just, I want to challenge you to do, I want to do what, what Jesus did with the Pharisees where it just completely breaks the mold of how you think. Because if you can break the mold of how you think and how you think Jesus thinks about you, then, then that, like, it leaves cracks for the truth to come in and for the truth to saturate you. And as that truth saturates you and as Jesus' love penetrates and as you learn that, you know what, I don't have to be judged. I don't have to feel judged. I don't have to feel just completely ashamed or I don't have to feel disqualified. I don't have to feel like I'm outside. I'm outside of Matthew's house. No, you're in, you're in the house. We're all in Matthew's house because we're all part of Matthew, the tax collectors and the sinners. And Jesus just waltzes right into our lives and he sits down and he says, hey, let's have relationship together. And so the band is going to play one more song for us. They're going to lead us in another worship song. And while they do that, I just want to invite you guys to stand and I want to invite you guys to sing along with them. But I also want to invite you to think about this question of, am I enough? And as you ask that question, you're not asking Jesus if you're enough. You're not asking God or or heaven or whatever it is you believe is the higher power, are you enough? You're asking yourself, hey, Chris, are you enough? Am I enough? And the answer to that is yes. But I hope that, that through this message that that some of that sinks in so that you can accept that. You can let yourself accept that you are enough and that Jesus loves you and he came for you. And you don't have to do anything but just be called by him and you're already called to come follow.